Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the 2019 Poor People's Energy Outlook. I'm Caroline McGregor, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for today on behalf of Sustainable Energy for All, and specifically the People-Centered Accelerator Coalition that I lead, which is focused on supporting efforts to extend energy services to the hardest to reach, the last mile in the, in the shorthand. That means the remote, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the poor. Um, and doing so with a strong commitment to gender equality and social inclusivity. And that's woven through everything we do. So, so given that approach to our coalition, it's hard to imagine much that's closer aligned with our interests than the poor people's energy outlook. Of course, stepping back, these tasks are made all the more challenging by the fact that as the latest SE for All energizing finance numbers show, only a tiny percentage, like 1.3% of overall electricity access funding goes to off-grid renewables, which are of course the most likely to be the least cost path to electricity in remote areas where so much of the unserved population resides. And on a cooking side, cooking receives only 1% of the funding it needs, and even far less than that because the needs that are quantified and were used to calculate that number only cover the equipment costs, and we know there's so much more. So the format for today will be part briefing, part commentary, and part discussion. We'll hear first from two of the leads on this work at Practical Action, Lucy Stevens and Uta Collier. They'll take about 20 minutes to walk us through the main dimensions of this year's report, which hopefully includes a bit of a refresher on the poor people's energy outlooks from the years past. And from there, we'll hear from the World Bank and GOGLA, two central players in the energy access space. We'll also hear from the Global Distributors Collective, uh, which has done much to raise the profile of women and men who are critical to reaching last mile populations. And we'll hear from the head of India's Greenway Appliances about what their experience has been in the clean cooking market. Each of these four discussants has agreed to keep the remarks to no more than 10 minutes to ensure we keep things moving and have adequate time at the end for your questions. So on that front, go ahead and as, as questions pop into your head, go ahead and share them via the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. So with that, I'll pass the floor to Lucy and Uta and the Poor People's Energy Outlook 2019. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, thanks very much for, for hosting us. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I uh, hope we can go to the next slide. Lovely. Okay, yes, well, uh, at this time of the year, you know, we're days away from, from the start of a new year, um, a new decade even. Uh, and we may maybe personally be reflecting on where we've come from or maybe commit to something new. And it's in that spirit that uh, we bring you this year's edition of the Poor People's Energy Outlook because it looks back to and compiles the work we've done since 2015 with a clear call for action for the coming decade. Uh, next slide. So the PPO series actually began in 2010 and, and initially uh, it set out a framework for total energy access across households, productive uses and community services. Uh, back, but then from 2015, we committed to producing a series of reports um, as a guide to delivering at national scales on that um, agenda, um, that energy access agenda that will most directly and holistically meet the needs of energy poor communities. Next slide. Okay, so those, uh, those three editions <clears throat> that sit over the last few years have focused on planning, financing, and last year on inclusive delivery at scale, each with recommendations for a more bottom-up approach. And now for 2019, we have compiled and updated our information compiled those editions, but also updated our information in line with advances in the sector and so on. Because uh, we know it's a fast moving sector, progress is being made, issues of energy access and reaching the last mile are receiving more attention and the evidence base of what is and isn't working is growing. However, I'm left with a feeling of urgency. Multiple obstacles remain and reaching those left behind by business as usual approaches is proving difficult. We need to grasp those challenges and start acting now, or we may get to 2030 and regret not taking bold action earlier. Next slide. So uh, what we'll cover now, our, our 2019 report, uh, it gives a, a, a 
take on the global trends and where we are now on the road to 2030. We then look in turn at clean cooking and fuels and electricity access from the perspectives of planning, financing and inclusive delivery at scale. And we end up by pulling this together with some key recommendations for action. Next slide. So uh, just a quick reminder that the research we've used as the basis for these reports has been data rich and also grounded. Uh, next slide. So uh, here are some of the key attributes of those methodologies that we've used. We've really consistently applied a gender lens and we've, we've, we've dealt with electricity and clean cooking on an equal footing. Um, and we've always tried to start with community level needs and priorities and putting these voices at the heart of the discussion. So uh, in 2016 and 17, uh, we based our work on three country case studies. That was Bangladesh, Kenya and Togo. And in 2018, we focused on six large scale delivery programs covering clean cooking and fuels, grid extension and off grid electricity. Next slide. So some of the methodologies for analysis that we used were innovative and it's worth highlighting a couple of those. One of them was the community level energy demand profiles that we developed as a basis for much of our analysis that helped us set priorities and think across the breadth of energy needs and listen properly to what would make the most difference in people's lives. The second thing, uh, aspect of me our methodologies that we used was was around developing indicators for inclusion at the sort of large programmatic scale uh, as a way of trying to ensure that inclusion is valued and pursued as much as the number of connections and we actually think that if these two elements in particular could be adopted at national scales uh, that would really make a, a significant difference to the direction and priorities for energy planning and programming and, and where we see these elements being taken up uh, that we're really pleased to see to see these aspects in other people's work. I'm going to hand on to Uta now. Uta. Next slide, please. And again. Great. Thanks, Caroline. So many of you will, of course, be familiar with the official SDG 7 tracking reports, which are produced by the World Bank, the IEA and a number of other organizations. So SDG 7, um, Universal Energy Access for All by 2030, was always going to be a big challenge. But the report this year again shows that we are a long way off from achieving that goal of energy of, of access by 2030. But let's be positive, first of all. Um, actually, almost 90% of people around the world have access to electricity now and all the benefits it can bring. What we've seen in particular in, in the last five to 10 years is that off-grid electricity, especially driven by the fall, falling costs of solar, has become a real game changer. So we now have more than 130 million people, mostly in rural areas, where previously there was very little chance of them getting access. They now have solar lighting, solar home systems, or even connections to renewable space mini grids. So that's great. However, and there's always a however in, in this field, unfortunately, the funding available to help us deliver SDG 7 by 2030 is far from enough. So even on electricity access, um, figures from SE4 all suggest that less than half of what is needed is actually being invested. So we have about $30 billion, um, but that which is not enough, but even worse, of that, actually only 1.3% go into off-grid solutions. So the solutions which we know are particularly effective to go to the last mile are not being invested in. And then once you get to clean cooking, the picture looks even worse. So we have less than 1% of the money needed for clean cooking actually being invested. And Caroline already mentioned, even that just tracks investment in the equipment and we need to do a lot for awareness, etc. So let's talk about cooking specifically. Next slide, please. And one more. So the fundamental daily tasks of lighting a fire, heating water and cooking food have never really been a political or de developmental priority, even though 
they contribute to nearly 4 million premature deaths, deaths a year because they're being done with dirty fuels, causing a lot of indoor air pollution. And on top of that, that, that cooking with, with biomass fuel also has a significant impact on climate change as well as local environmental sustainability. So when we looked at cooking issues in 2016 in, in the communities during our energy planning exercises, we saw some of the realities of the situation faced by rural communities and, and specifically, of course, rural women. So the time spent on cooking is actually significant, especially once you add the collecting and preparing of the fuel. So in the communities we looked at, we saw about five hours on average. Even though it takes up all this time, clean cooking isn't actually always the top priority, especially when compared to electricity access. And there are some people who still have a preference for traditional solutions. However, at the same time, many, and here's the figure of 51 percent, are dissatisfied and want to leapfrog to entirely clean solutions if they could. And that we see, for example, in places like Kenya, where, where there have been public awareness campaigns about the health effects of cooking, which of course helps. In 2017, when we looked at financing, um, we found that actually it, it's quite a complex picture. Um, we and of course, since then, we've also reviewed um, some of the changes in prices. So in 2019, um, things have slightly moved on. So in some respects, it actually means that the costs of clean cooking with uh, options like LPG, bioethanol or biogas have been falling. And because we've got cheaper off-grid electricity with solar in some instances, electric powered cooking is actually becoming more both technically and um, technically feasible and cost effective. However, unless there are significant efforts to build markets for these fuels and appliances, they won't be available for people. Poor people may end up relying even more on charcoal where prices continue to rise. So, We've got significant challenges remaining in closing the affordability gap and reaching the poorest uh, consumers, which have inevitably burn fuel. So I've already said some of the costs have come down, but even when we looked in 2017, 16 and 17, some of the options were already cheaper then, for example, improved biomass cook stoves, yet there isn't necessarily a willingness to invest. Overall, the cost of transition to clean cooking is actually higher for than for electricity access, and that is not being acknowledged. I mean, obviously, some of it is due to the fact that we've got many more people needing clean cooking solutions. So we talk about 3 billion versus less than 1 billion. So the costs are, are high due to that. So next slide. Thanks. The reality is that in most countries, cooking is still done by women. And hence, of course, women are most at risk from the health consequences of dirty fuels. But when it comes to participating in the clean cooking market, either as consumers or as entrepreneurs, they face a specific set of problems. I give you a few examples. Um, they often have very poor access to consumer finance. Often they don't hold, hold bank accounts, which may, may be held by their husbands. If they are in business, they often find it difficult to access business credits because they tend to be very small businesses, so lower down the value chain, which financial institutions see as riskier. And then also, often there are there is a lack of female role models in business. And of course, later on, we'll hear from Neha, who is, who is one of those women who have managed to do that. Um, and this is not something we found on our own. So recently, there have been um, reports published by Energia and V4W and the Shell Foundation, and they confirm that 
involving, involving women in energy value chains and empowering them actually is really good for them and for business. So, so there is lots of positives in trying to solve this issue. Next slide. So, so to summarize on cooking, I think we all know there are a number of challenges. Um, we've, we're just mentioning three here, but there are of course many more. So there is the issue of that we really need to leapfrog to the clean solutions. Um, whereas we have quite a few solutions out there which don't achieve as, as much as maybe we would like to. Um, the affordability gap clearly is significant and one of the really difficult things is reaching the poorest rural wood burning consumers. So in the, in the 2018 PPO, for example, we have shown some successes of programs which have um, targeted more of the uh, semi-urban um, charcoal using um, populations, but getting to the, the last mile rural consumers is, is very challenging. So our recommendations to policymakers and to donors and financiers are, are quite, we have quite a uh, um, comprehensive set of recommendations, but I just want to focus on three here. I mean, first of all, we do need policymakers to set ambitious national targets, because at the moment we don't see them. There are very few countries which have a cooking target. Um, Kenya is one example, they recently agreed to that. But most countries, if they have targets at all for energy access, then they're always focused on electricity. So we need people to elevate cooking to the top of the political agenda. We of course need finance boosted at all levels because as I said, um, it's, it's woefully inadequate, but that's of course quite a complex um, issue and needs to be uh, tackled by all sorts of different institutions. And then finally, building gender aware campaigns for market activation, which can bring lots of benefits. So I pass back to Lucy to talk about electricity access. Super, thank you. Yes, so thinking about elect or the electricity side of things, um, next slide. Our 2016 planning exercises um, underlined some of the realities of the situation facing these rural communities. I was reminded actually of, of how much difference a, a basic electricity supply can make to people. A community member in Bolivia who said, now we have a, a way, we have light, as if we are climbing the steps to a better and better life. Obviously, we know that really making that transformation depends on a whole bunch of other things, but it's good to remind ourselves of that. Now, the majority of households that we uh, looked at in, in the communities that we were that were off grid, so they had off grid electricity access if they had any. They had sort of tier zero or one electricity, but many of them had aspirations to use power and appliances that would amount to kind of tier two or three and more for, uh, for their businesses. But even in communities where there was easy access to those kind of off grid solutions, maybe through IDCOL in Bangladesh, for example, still the poorest 20 or 40 percent of the community were not able to pay for or use these and so they remained excluded which reminds us that sometimes these market-based solutions still leave people out in a lot of uh, communities the top priority was for household lighting that's not a surprise we should remember that that's for outside and inside the house but beyond that we should remember that uh, and we highlighted how women tend to prioritize things like energy for schools, energy to pump water for drinking, and um, energy to process crops. These are priorities that don't often make it high up the uh, list of priorities in the same way as lighting. Um, we also know that to provide electricity access to, to remote communities, it can be expensive. It's obviously more expensive than, a, than a, an electricity connection in a city for an exist, with an existing grid. But grid tariffs don't, don't cover those costs. And actually the average willingness to pay is about half of the cost of provision in, in those areas. Um, we also rem remind ourselves that, that, that the range of solutions, of the range of solutions on offer, about 11 of our 12 communities that we looked at in 2016, off-grid solutions were cheaper than or cost competitive with grid-based solutions. 
and that we found that around two thirds of the, of the unelectrified, those who were still beyond the grid in Bangladesh and Kenya, and all of those in Togo could be most cheaply reached with off-grid solutions, which brought our results more or less in line with other people's modeling, the UN DESA or, or the IEA. And this is before we even begin to consider things like the time needed for deploying grid-based solutions, uh, especially if that means new generation capacity or, or uh, new di distribution infrastructure. There's growing evidence that greater investments in renewable and off-grid energy create more jobs in the economy. And with costs continuing to fall, the economic case for off-grid renewables now is even stronger than it was in 2016 or 17. Next slide. However, there are important barriers to inclusion, which were revealed as they were in for clean cooking, right across our work from what is prioritized in planning to how finance is provided and who can access it to how programs actually deliver on the ground. And this means that, for example, that, that generally men will continue to benefit more and be better served than women and poor households and remote communities will continue to not be reached. We also uh, looked at where investments in uh, energy access and off-grid energy are being concentrated and we know that East Africa continues to be a hotspot. Uh, new investments we found were being um, announced in other places like Bangladesh which have uh, made progress but the amounts, as we highlighted earlier, still fall far short of what's needed. Um, and with them being concentrated, what that means is that other countries in dire need are, are, being, are still being left out. Next slide. So some of our, our key recommendations in this area were around the need to plan for uh, an integrated approach across standalone systems, mini grids and grid extension. Um, we need to think beyond the household, we need to set smart subsidies uh, and we need to measure and value inclusion. Next slide. Okay, so in our report we highlight three top priorities for a range of different stakeholders recognising that everyone needs to take action, not just governments. Uh, we need action from a wide range of stakeholders working together if we're to achieve the transformations that are, that are required. Uh, so. We set out at the beginning of this process to produce a series of reports that would act as a guide to delivering on energy access at national scales in ways that would directly meet and holistically meet the needs of energy poor communities. So our evidence, our case studies, our stakeholder consultations, they've reinforced the view that this is not that what we need is not really a blueprint or something prescriptive, but we need to ensure an inclusive process which is guided, but one that's guided by that really clear vision for inclusion and some really deliberate actions about how to make sure that that inclusion happens. So the bedrock of, of that needs to be, for example, holistic approaches that bring together grid and off grid and prioritize clean cooking at the same time. Holistic approaches that address demand and policy and finance, as well as just thinking about supply. We need a stronger role for public funding that can be applied in smart ways and our 2018 report and 17 report highlights some ways of doing that and we need to embrace measure value inclusivity and uh, championing women's empowerment and supporting those multi-stakeholder processes so that we ensure we are continuously listening to the voices of poor communities who are the ones who will otherwise be left behind next slide so before i close uh i wanted to highlight a number of ways in which we're working to get these messages out uh, to key audiences globally, how you can find out more information. So this webinar is obviously part of that wider, pro is part of a wider process of, of engagement and, and dissemination. We regularly hold launch and discussion events at national levels, um, some in, in our focus countries of operation. So if you're dialing in from any of those countries, welcome, but also please keep an eye out for those events because they'll be about how we translate some of these mes big messages in, in, at, at the national level. Um, we, uh, our report is, is the 2019 report is currently available in English, but in the next three months or so, there will be uh, editions available in French, Spanish, and Arabic this year. Uh, 
You can also follow the discussions on social media with the hashtag PPO2019. And so, and, and at the website of practicalaction.org, you can download all the resources, four page summary, all the infographics that we've highlighted a few of today. So really this is also an invitation. Uh, it's my opportunity to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who's engaged with us so far. And it's great to share these findings uh, with you. And, and we look forward to ongoing discussion and engagement with you all. Caroline, back to you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Lucy. Thanks so much, Ute. This was a marvelous, really marvelous presentation. I, <clears throat> um, you did a, just such a great job of walking us through um, what I know is an immense, immense amount of research that, that underlies it and presented so, so clearly. Um, the, the affordability gap is always interesting to us. And, you know, as most of you know, SE for All spends a lot of time thinking about finance. Um, what the finance gaps are, how we can um, mobilize high levels of policy and policymakers uh, to help close them. And one thing that we're, we've spent a lot of time looking at lately is um, what we're calling energy safety nets, but using that public funding, um, channeling uh, and, and using public assistance uh, mechanisms like what you'd consider welfare um, in other countries, um, to, to pay for, to help close that affordability gap for the poorest, whether it's 20%, 40% um, in, in a given country. And what, what I think is pretty interesting that comes out of this is this important distinction between the upfront investment cost of getting access, but then there's the ongoing recurring cost of using the energy. And often we, we conflate the two into just access. Um, and I think as as the energy access space has grown and evolved and become more sophisticated, we're getting a, a greater vocabulary around this, but the affordability gap that exists both um, on the capital investment side, but then the, the ongoing spending side is so interesting. And maybe we'll have a chance to come back to that in questions, but um, I'll turn now to um, the first of our discussants. We're so lucky to be joined by Donna Rostankova from the World Bank. She leads the energy access work across the entire bank, which is an immense job. So Donna, thank you for being here. I wonder if you could talk us um, through a little bit of um, the inclusion aspect, right? The, the Poor People's Energy Outlook recommends finding ways to value inclusion as much as the numbers of connections. And I wonder if the World Bank might help um, be able to build some of this into the work that you support. Um, would a simple index be helpful? That's sort of a starter question. And then just to give you uh, the second question up front and let, leave it to you how you want to, to address them. The second question we have for you is around engaging with national governments and the planning, the very high level planning processes that are used to design new energy access programs and policies. What can you tell us about whether there are any signs of change in business as usual approaches? Um, and is there potential for programs to go beyond household electricity and, in, and be more integrated, integrate more the, the off-grid access questions? So that's, um, that's a lot, but I'm gonna pass it over to you. We can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. First of all, can you hear me? We can, oh. we can. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, so thanks a lot. And first of all, thank, thanks very much for this opportunity to provide a few remarks at this webinar. And above all, really congratulations and many thanks to Lucy and the Practical Action for, for, the, for this longstanding effort in bringing up consistently the importance of inclusion and highlighting the needs of the poor. Uh, I really think it's largely to this effort that we now see more progress in reaching the more remote and poorer households, as well as that more uh, attention is given to issues like gender mainstreaming um, and the sort of also um, emerging understanding that electrification is not just on the supply side and demand side. So thank you very much for bringing up these issues. I'd like to pick up on one thought that, that comes, uh, comes out in the paper. And that's about this, uh, um, there's a little bit of tension uh, between the scale and inclusivity, right? Because often we think we need to achieve the scale, we just need to pick up the 
easiest connections that are there and maybe we care about inclusivity a little bit later and I'd, I'd like to that's usually how we think about it but I'd like to challenge that, uh, that idea and if you can go to the next slide I think the the issue here is that I think electricity side this is no longer a, a choice um, if you look at the at the figures that are emerging from the latest SDG 7 uh, what we see is that uh, the majority, uh, first of all, the majority of an electrified population is rural. And so really the low hanging fruit of urban and very urban population is no longer there. Furthermore, uh, also as pointed in the report, there's a growing gap in between countries in terms of their progress in electrification. So while we have accelerated globally quite a lot in the, in the, in the last uh, 10 years and especially in the last three years, there's, there's a huge gap across the countries, and especially we see low income countries, and in particular the FCV countries. Donna, I'm so, Donna, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Oh, okay. um, there's a clicking noise that's a little bit mysterious. I don't know if you can troubleshoot that on your side. You can diagnose it, but it seems to have gone away at the moment. That's beautiful. And um, please, um, we, we know we gave you tight time constraints, but um, feel free to yeah. slow down and take your time because. Your, everything you say is so information packed. It's so dense with 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 great stuff. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm not sure where the clicking noise comes. I don't hear anything here, but hopefully it will go away. It's okay. We can still hear you. So go ahead. Okay. So on the um, so so the point that I was making is that what we see is as the electrification is progressing, that the um, population that is being left behind and needs to be electrified and where we need to reach the scale is not so easily to reach uh, because most of the population is rural 87 percent of the 840 million without access are in rural areas and increasingly more remote um, about quarter of an electrified population is in countries that are in conditions of uh, fragility, conflict, and violence. Um, as a result, we're also seeing an increasing number of displaced people uh, that typically do not have access to, to energy services. And uh, finally, really one important group of um, customers that are left behind are. Uh, public institutions such as uh, health centers and schools, um, we will clearly not realize the impact that we want to see from electrification in terms of uh, building the human capital and so on, um, if we do not address uh, those. And finally, uh, what we uh, need to see is also um, that uh, without uh, uh, progress on clean cooking, we are really leaving not only large population behind, but we have especially are not addressing the, the really important um, uh, issues that are related to gender. And also we are not addressing issues of vulnerable populations, including children, which actually are the highest victim of uh, pollution. So what I'd like to see, and uh, Caroline, I don't know if you cl can click once again on the slide because there's a chart that is not showing up. And more. And more. Okay. So um, what I believe, what we believe is that this idea of going faster and leaving inclusions for later is no longer possible because um, if we do that, then basically we will reach the wall. The population that needs to be reached now is a population that is not so easy to reach. And if we leave it to the end, then we electrify the last remaining, remaining, remaining few of the easy populations, and we will not get to, um, to the scale because everyone that uh, is more difficult to reach will not be reached. And we will be scratching our head. What are the approaches to uh, to, to to reach those? What kind of uh, smart subsidies do we need to reach them? What kind of business models are more appropriate? 
the rich, really remote populations. And uh, so I, I think that uh, what we will see much more is that uh, the approaches that are emerging, and this is definitely the way we are looking at this at the World Bank, is that combine this idea of reaching scale and accelerating pace with the idea that by definition, this also needs to be more inclusive. And we have to find a way how, how this inclusion actually happens uh, at scale. So what we are doing is uh, to, to get to basically the scale and, and inclusion at the same time. On the electricity side, we, have, we are engaging with the government primarily at the, at the first level is to help them to develop uh, integrated electrification plans that uh, integrate different technologies and don't look only at the issue of efficiency, like what's the least cost to achieve everyone, but also the issue of equity how to reach everyone in a more equitable way, how not to let the most remote populations to wait for 10, 20 years so that the least cost solution reaches them, work both on and bottom up. What usually appears in as the result of these uh, plans is that on one hand, uh, we have a um, huge uh, opportunity for greater densification. So much less than extending it, usually what you find out, is that the majority of the population is actually under the grid. And so these are usually people that are poor or relatively lower income. And usually the issue why they are not connected is related to affordability, mostly because they cannot pay for the connection fees. So what, what, we, what, we, what we typically do and recommend and work with the governments to do is to, is to design not just supply side intervention, but also demand side intervention to basically help these households to overcome the affordability constraints to either subsidize the connection or allow them to pay it over time. At the same time, what we see for, for rural areas is that more and more the, the lowest cost is to use mini grid and off grid technologies. So we are helping governments to. Um, uh, to design really many grid and off grid scale up the programs. Um, we have currently a portfolio of investments in mini grid and off grid electrification of about 1 billion, and we are expanding them. Looking at, uh, we are looking into how, um, how to design subsidies more, more efficiently. And I think here the issue is that yes, there is an affordability gap. Yes, subsidies will be needed to bridge it. We have to figure out how to do it so that it's uh, it's really effective and it is uh, sustainable. So we are having some interesting experiences that we are leveraging, uh, such as in Kenya in the COSAP program, we have a set up result-based financing facility that is helping the companies that are operating in the sort of more densely populated market to go into the rural areas and serve those households, and we are learning from that. In other places, such as in Burundi, we are now uh, testing some direct demand side subsidies to, to the households. There we work uh, with the social safety net program and see whether we can add uh, a subsidy that will allow households basically to go to the market and get uh, their off-grid systems. And we will be summarizing these experiences in a publication that should uh, come out uh, um, early next uh, year. And on cooking, we feel that uh, really we need to integrate better between cooking into operations. And what we have seen is that I agree that for now, I think uh, from the government perspectives, uh, we see a little less of uh, um, demand coming for clean cooking programs. But I think it is also changing. And I'm, I think I'm just seamlessly now transitioning to the second sector. What do, what do we see in the governments? And um, so I, we see that this is beginning to change and we are trying to, um, to, to incentivize this change uh, furthermore. And so this is one of the reasons, and some of you probably have heard the announcements in SMAP, we have decided to set up a Clean Cooking Fund uh, with the intention to mobilize uh, $500 million. And the fund is specifically for 
uh, mostly for the to incentivize the government to borrow actually from uh, the um, uh, from the uh, from the IDA or IDRD from the World Bank, and if they for clean cooking, and if they do so, they get additional grant funding uh, from the fund that can be used uh, especially for results-based financing in the cooking sector. The idea here is especially where we have large-scale electrification operations to create space, to also include uh, a component for clean cooking and start actually bringing resources into this space and start building up greater government commitment uh, for, for this uh, space. So, so when it comes to what do we see in the government, I think we see that there is, um, there is a gradual change. The change doesn't happen everywhere and the change doesn't happen from one day to another. But as we are getting much closer to the, uh, to, to, to the SDG 7 2030 deadline, we're beginning to see that the governments are opening up uh, their, 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 uh, their programs because they see that the tra traditional approaches, mainly great extension, is not going to get there. They also see that there is a power again in numbers and examples that countries that are more proactively supporting other solutions, um, uh, like Kenya, Rwanda, other East African countries, are moving their electrification rates much faster than the countries that do not. And so there, there is an increasing openness to, to, uh, to, to look into uh, off-grid solutions. And the geospatial um, mapping and geospatial least cost electrification plans are really also opening up eyes of the government. We have seen this is incredibly powerful when you can show the governments on a on a map, how where the grid is and where the populations are, and actually, which is the best way to reaching them. And this is uh, why we also uh, we have invested into a new tool that, if you haven't tried it yet, I encourage you to go and play with it. It's the global electrification platform that is uh, basically allowing users to build their own least cost uh, plans, uh, electrification plans based on different scenarios and so it's really a good tool for this high level of planning and sit down with the governments and for the governments to sit down with the development partners private sector civil society and be on the same page about what, do, what does make sense in this in this country and um, also we see that increasingly the governments are looking into um, expanding basically the support just from the households to the public institutions. Here the issue is mostly to find the right business model that will ensure sustainability and also for the productive uses. And again, I think the governments are interested to see impact of electrification. It's more that they do not know how best to support it. So I think collectively our, our work in finding out really what works, how do you really engage with it, in a way that there is impact is very important and bringing those experiences uh, to, to scale. So I will here. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you for this. Um, I'm really excited to, to, to see the platform is live and I look forward to clicking it around myself. I know um, this is for everyone's information, Donna's going to have to jump, so we won't have the benefit of a Q&A with you, but we would just really appreciate the time you've spent um, giving, giving the bank perspective on all of this, and I think it's a testament to how hard you and your team work um, that you uh, ha have been able to make the case for the, in these inclusive approaches, these integrated approaches, and just um, on behalf of all of us, thank you for that, and keep up the great work. I'm sorry, I just realized I didn't answer the question on index. Can I, can I just take one minute? Just real quick, Donna, and then you, I know you yeah, have to go. Yes, yes, yes. So on the, on the, on the index side, uh, I, I just wanted to say that I am not sure whether this would really help because uh, I think it's a very complex issue. The inclusion happens in so many different levels. And so my warning just to be not to sort of put in some methodology that says this is inclusion, this is not inclusion, that may 
somehow skew the, the interventions into an area that maybe is even not the most impactful and, and helpful. What I find most useful uh, is uh, what really keep creating and continue creating this awareness why inclusion matters. And then it's not just inclusion for the inclusion, but it's the only way how we can actually electrify everyone and how we can achieve impact. And especially to share lessons of, of the practical approaches that work. Because I don't think anyone, there are not many governments or institutions that do not want to be inclusive. It's more a matter of understanding how, how do we get there, what really works um, that, uh, that matters most and what works in a sustainable way. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thanks again, Donna. So next, I want to turn to Drew Corbin, who's here with us representing GOGLA. Drew, as the PPEO points out, we're collectively a long way from achieving SDG 7. But according to GOGLA's off-grid market report, there's been some remarkable progress in some areas. I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about the products, the countries, the, the places where you've seen impressive growth and what the key drivers of this growth have been. And then the second part of my two-part question is, is around enabling frameworks and, and the need for governments to create the right enabling framework for energy access markets to work. That's, that certainly comes out strongly in, in this year's Poor People's Energy Outlook. But, question for you is what types of regulatory or fiscal measures do you, your members think are most crucial to allow them to operate effectively? So over to you. Thank you so much, Drew, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for the question, Hannah, and this opportunity to uh, contribute to the webinar. Um, let me start by saying a, a, a huge thanks and congratulations to Practical Action for putting together um, another great PPO. It's um, PPO's been active for, for a decade now and doing a great job raising the profile of, of energy for development and a call to action for the for many different stakeholders. Um, so let, let me um, say a few words about Gogla. Maybe not all of the audience is aware uh, of, of who we are. Gogla is the global association for the off-grid solar industry. And our mission is to build sustainable markets with profitable companies that sell quality and affordable products um, to off-grid and weak grid customers in the developing world. We have 160 members in the association based around the world. There's manufacturers, distributors and technology providers, as well as investors, sector support programs and national renewable energy associations. Uh, our product focus is on solar lanterns, solar home systems, appliances, and uh, solar productive use technologies. And as an association, we provide four services. Firstly, sales data and market trends, which I'll be showing uh, a bit more in my next slide. Secondly, networking and events. Thirdly, uh, we do advocacy um, to um, policymakers and investors. And thirdly, we promote stand. Sorry, fourthly, we promote standards and guidelines for responsible business. Um, and yeah, so let me answer your first question by moving to the next slide, please. So this is some some data from the. Um, from a, a sales database which uh, Google manages with their with the um, partners um, from Lighting Global and Efficiency for Access. And the big headline here is that 46 million products have been sold in the last decade. And this is um, giving benefits to 110 million people that are enjoying um, using uh, off-grid solar products. And this is having tremendous uh, economic, environmental, and social benefits. And, and we know this, we, we have the evidence for it. Um, for example, a, a recent uh, Google report called uh, Powering Opportunity from West Africa, which surveyed around 2,000 consumers, found that there were the overwhelming majority of the, the product users said that the, the product gave them an improved quality of life, more study time, uh, they were healthier, safer, um, and there was more uh, economic activity. Um, so the, the data showed that um, the, 
the solar home system is it, it allows people to um, delay household chores to the evening if they've got lights so that they, they can do that at home in the evening and it also allows them to avoid wasting time on phone charging or you know going to buy a paraffin or um, you know another traditional uh, source of fuel and this equates to for, for every one hundred solar home systems sold it equates to um, eight full-time jobs generated so the, the time savings uh, for 100 systems gives you eight eight um, jobs uh, equivalent of time and that's um, the, the people who are benefiting this we found that of those eight full-time jobs three would be from women and six would be in rural areas um, you know of course that's spread over you know the, the hundred households you know some don't do anything you know some have got maybe half a day or there's an hour here or there so that's going to be just a, an equivalent benchmark now looking at the the detailed data from um, the first half of 2019 uh, which is in the in the box on the slide here um, Google members and uh, affiliates of the program sold uh, four million um, products the large volume of that, uh, 3.1 million, is for uh, solar lanterns and multi-light systems on a cash basis. Whereas the, the big value um, comes from the pay-as-you-go systems, uh, which are largely linked to the, the larger solar home systems. And we see as a, as a trend that the, the market is moving away from the, the lanterns and multi-light systems to, to the larger systems and away from cash sales to, to pay-go. You know, that, that's fantastic, you know, of course, the, the bigger systems, you know, the more um, kind of uh, use and impact that they generate. But we're, we're concerned that there is a, a fatigue in the, the solar lantern market and, and that it's, um, it's stagnating. And if you look at the, you know, the, the low income consumers and, you know, people in hard to reach places, it's often the, the, the lanterns, which is their first experience of the, the technology, their, their first step on the, the energy ladder. And, and the lantern market is under pressure from, from commodification, you know, the entry level um, low cost generics, which are a tough competition for quality verified goods. The policy landscapes in, in many places is, is not supportive of, the, the, of this um, product category. And also there's some um, donor and business fatigue, you know, people are thinking beyond lighting to, to larger systems. And um, another trend that's coming through is the um, we've recently started collecting data on appliances. Um, in the first half of 2019, um, the members and affiliates sold 190,000 TVs. Um, they were mainly in East Africa and mainly sold on Pago. And um, in, uh, there was also 530,000 electric fans sold. And the majority of them were um, in South Asia. At the same time, um, we're, we're tracking productive uses, and there was three thousand solar water pumps sold. And um, so, you know, great to see that becoming established, but still, you know, quite quite modest in number and compared to the potential that's out there. There's still huge gains to be made. I'm thinking of the the geographies. Um, so the big the biggest single country market is in India, um, and the biggest single region is in in East Africa and the, the countries that are there. Um, but there's, there's also, um, you know, significant um, uh, movement and growth in, in other regions and, and countries, notably Nigeria, Zambia, Papua New Guinea. And, um, yeah, you can dig into the sales report online to see um, country specific data and um, product category specific data. So while this is, you know, I think positive news, you know, the, the last decade, um, you know, selling 46 million lights is, is significant. I think there's, there's also a word of caution. Um, Uta points to, to a, an electricity access or an energy, yeah, electricity access deficit of 612 million. Um, you know, there's still massive work to be done in the next decade. And yeah, like I said, we're, we're concerned that there's concern about fatigue um, in the, the lighting market. And we think we need to redouble our efforts to achieve universal energy access, to, to reach the poor, the poorest people and to build markets in, in forgotten countries. Um, so it's going to take more investment from, uh, from companies, development partners, NGOs and governments. And that segues onto my 
uh, my next slide and answering the next points, you know, what, what Drew, can... if, Drew, if I could just ask you to take maybe another minute, minute or two, just to, to get through, um, get through your slides. That would be wonderful. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So Google has um, developed a series of guidance notes, notes based on our member experiences of what it takes to build a market. And uh, there is a guidance note for, for each of these topics here. Um, and you can find the, the publication on, on the website. Um, yeah, uh, let me take quality assurance as an example because that's what I'm interested in. We believe that good quality builds trust in the technology, builds demand for the market, and that can accelerate growth. And to, to achieve that, government should adopt standards, use this for importation, control, and enforcement, raise awareness among stakeholders, and offer incentives. So that's kind of the, the depth that's, that's there in one of them, and you can find others elsewhere. If you're also um, interested to, to look at any of these topics, I'd encourage you to um, take a look at the Global Forum. And Hannah, if you can take me on to the next slide, please. Um, where we will be discussing a lot more of these, these themes. Um, so this is our biannual event in Nairobi in, uh, in February, um, where we're going to be having dialogue, learning and networking around a, a broad set of themes, policy, investment, technology, business, impact. Um, the Poor People's Energy is also one of the, Poor People's Energy Outlook is also one of the, the side sessions that's gonna be there. And we hope to have the SE for All uh, CEO, Dami Lola in the, in the opening panel alongside other dignitaries. Um, so yeah, it'd be great to see as many of you there as possible. Um, Thanks for listening to, to the presentation and I'd welcome any, any questions in the chat box or, or the Q&A later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Drew. Uh, we will move now to Emma Colenbrander from the Global Distributors Collective. Emma, I'll just summarize the two questions. So one is around um, how the Global Distributors Collective can support the companies that are doing, you know, the, the real rubber meets the road work of, of reaching the last mile and why, tell us a bit about why they're such critical stakeholders for, for SDG7. And then we're also interested to hear from you about access to finance and how that can be a barrier for entrepreneurs. Um, and, and what insights are, available from the last mile distribution state of the sector report that you put out recently. Thank you so much, Emma, over to you. Thanks a lot, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Um, very happy to be part of this discussion today and, and not least because the Poor People's Energy Outlook has historically shone a light on some of the issues that really sit at the core of, of what we do at the Global Distributors Collective. Um, as Caroline mentioned at the GDC, we focus on supporting last mile distribution organizations who reach last mile markets with beneficial products. Um, we recently launched our state of the sector report on last mile distribution, which is the very first report of its kind. Um, and as you'll see, um, there are many points of alignment between our report and what we've already heard today. Um, it's very encouraging to see these messages gaining traction across the, the broader energy access community. Um, so if we could go to the, the first slide. Sorry, the next slide, yes, perfect, thank you. Um, so distributors are critical to achieving SDG 7 for a, for a number of reasons. So first of all, they help close the access gap by selling beneficial products. And these products include water filters, agricultural inputs, appliances, nutrition products, and of course, solar lights and improved cook stoves and fuels. Um, some of these products uh, help achieve achieve tier one or tier two access, but other products like solar lanterns represent critical interim solutions. As Drew spoke about before, they really are the first step um, for consumers on the energy access ladder. Um, the average number of people who have been reached to date by last mile distributors um, is about 170,000 people. Um, at the GDC, we have about 140 members, last mile distribution companies. So if you extrapolate that number across our membership, we're talking about around 23 million people who've been reached to date by last mile distributors. Secondly, distributors deliberately target more difficult, less commercial markets. As is very visible through the PPEO, we need to continuously be mindful of those markets and those people who are often not attractive to commercial companies, often because of their remoteness and income levels. Um, and 
actively work to deliver programs and services with these consumers in mind. And this is exactly what last mile distribution companies do. Um, three quarters of uh, customers who are served by GDC members live in poverty on less than $3.20 a day. And actually 44% of customers live in extreme poverty on less than $1.90 a day. So thirdly, distributors play a key role in building markets. Um, they're often the first movers in last mile communities and they build demand by creating trust in brand new product categories and helping people to experience the benefits of products firsthand. They also often help consumers build a credit history. And so what that means is that they're creating an opportunity for other types of companies to enter these markets and sustainably serve low income consumers. So fourthly, distributors are committed to quality and customer service, which really dispels one of the, the myths about distributors. Um, they're not selling cheap, low quality products and, and dumping them on last mile doorsteps and running away. As you can see here, 69% of them offer consumer financing and 65% of them offer warranties. Um, and this kind of service and quality is really important to making sure that consumers have a positive experience with their product and that they recommend the product to others. So next, distributors play an important role in creating jobs. They create jobs in retail and sales, and that has positive knock-on effects across the whole value chain. Um, and often distributors will deliberately target women. Um, you're probably familiar with last mile distribution companies like Solar Sister and Pollinate and El Soler, who explicitly target female entrepreneurs in their sales agent networks. And finally, distribution companies are mostly local. 60% of our members have at least one local founder. And what this means is that they are deeply embedded in last mile communities. They have strong local networks and a, a deep understanding of the needs of their end consumers. Um, the distribution sector is a big sector um, and these companies are not the only route to serve the last mile. You have other organizations like MFIs and uh, manufacturers with proprietary distribution networks, multinationals, independent retailers selling beneficial products, but distributors are having a very significant impact and they have potential to make a real contribution to SDG 7. Um, but despite that, their unique characteristics and contributions tend to have been overlooked. So they represent a real untapped opportunity. Um, so next slide, please. So to answer the question about access to finance, I mean, it's not gonna surprise anyone to hear that access to finance really is the number one challenge faced by last mile distribution companies. And I think we're all broadly familiar with what these challenges are because they are similar to those faced by, by across the wider SME sector. So from the perspective of the distributors, the minimum investment sizes are too high, interest rates are too high, collateral requirements are hard to meet, uh, all the application processes and the due diligence processes are too complex. And then on the other side, from the investor perspective, they see distribution as being just too risky and the transaction costs are too high on a, on a large number of small investments, um, need a high return to justify the high risk um, and distributors have limited track records and there's not much data about their performance so they can't be benchmarked. Um, so two very different perspectives there but I think what we're seeing is a really critical uh, part of this challenge is that distributors struggle to access long-term growth capital and that's for, for all sources of, of capital. So we found that about 86% of distributors have raised grant funding, 86%. So that's pretty high but this is very rarely in large enough volumes or long term enough to enable distributors to grow to the extent that they really need to then access more commercial capital. So they're not able to bridge that valley of death. When we look at equity here on this slide, you can see that by far the primary source of equity for distributors is individuals, family, friends, and angel investors or founders themselves. And this type of equity makes sense for startups, but it's not sufficient for distributors looking to grow. In terms of debt, you'll see crowdfunding is one of the top funding sources for distributors. Um, and while these type of loans and also loans from family or friends or angel investors are, are helpful and they're often available without collateral, again, they're not of the size or the duration that's needed to meet the working capital needs of distribution companies. And then finally, I think it's, it, it's important to note here when we're talking about challenges with raising capital that accessing finance is more of a 
challenge for local companies than it is for international companies. And we found that this was true across all types of, of capital, but particularly debt. Um, quite a stark finding from our report is that um, only 56% of distributors with a local founder have raised debt. And that's compared to 87% of those uh, who do not have a local founder. So that's a 30% differential, which is fairly significant. So final slide. Our report uh, shone a light on a few emerging innovations and solutions to try and tackle some of these challenges. So first of all, there is a need for more dedicated grant making mechanisms for last mile distribution. And here we shone a bit of a spotlight on DPRIZE, which is a, uh, a foundation that provides startup seed grants, small funding, uh, 10 to 20,000 US dollars. Um, and they have actually supported about 10% of the GDC's membership. So they play a really important role in the space. But DeepRise themselves have talked about the huge challenges that their uh, fundees face after their grant funding expires. Um, there's just not the long-term flexible grant funding that's needed to help see distributors through the valley of death and build long-term sustainable models. So secondly, there's a real need for uh, more um, uh, financial and technical support that's bundled together. Um, and we are seeing some exciting innovations in this space. So the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship runs a dedicated accelerator just for last mile distribution companies. Um, and that's a program that um, combines capacity building over a number of months with matchmaking with uh, investors at the end of that program. Uh, Venture Builder, which you might have, uh, have seen launched uh, this year is another really exciting example. And then finally, uh, we're starting to see increasingly partnerships between investors and software platforms. Um, and this is a way that investors can leverage third party verified data um, from platforms like Angaza that can bring down the due diligence costs and the risks um, of investing in distributors. Um, so the, the SEMA and Gaza Distributor Financing Fund was launched a couple of weeks ago and is a, a sort of stellar example of this um, in action. Um, so a few exciting, exciting examples here and, and more interest. We're seeing more interest in developing new mechanisms to support distributors, but, but not enough. Um, so if you'd like to read more, you can um, visit the website. The link is at the bottom of this slide here and download the report from our website um, or get in touch if you have any further questions. Um, and I'll hand back to you, Caroline, to, to take over from here. Thank you, Emma. <clears throat> Last but not least, we're gonna hear from Neha Janeja. And of course, after that, we'll turn to questions. And I can see people are already um, be feeding us their, their great questions. First, Neha. Um, yes. Hi, your company has been selling stoves since I think 2013. It's a good long time, um, mm -hmm. but that's that's more that's not all that you do. Um, but I'm wondering if today we could get you to to share with us a bit about the business model and and um, how how your business for good approach works and 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 how it's been achieved, how it's important to your success. This is, of course really in line with um, what the PPEO has consistently advocated for around gender inclusive business approaches. And then secondly, um, the, on the cooking front, right, the PPEO identifies rural wood burning households as a particularly important market segment for improving global clean cooking practices, but then stove stacking, affordability challenges, cultural barriers um, are, are also barriers to uptake. And, I'm wondering what your kind of lived experience has has been with these challenges and and what lessons learned. So over sure, to Car you. thank you, Caroline, and um, thank you everyone for having me today. Um, very quickly, we started as a you know startup enterprise focused entirely on those households who were burning wood and were unlikely to graduate to solutions like LPG or electricity. Um, it needs to be borne in mind that India is a country where you have a few hundred million households who cook in a clean way and you have about 700 million individuals who cook on firewood and while some uh, a lot of us may assume that these 700 million will start cooking like the other 500 million there's there are huge affordability barriers that exist which is why a more intermediate solution was needed and hence greenway was started uh, 2013 um, if we can move to the next slide 
So we are just very quickly, we are India's largest uh, clean cook stoves company. As uh, Emma was categorizing, we are a manufacturer with proprietary distribution. This means that uh, while we have distribution partners, we also have a field strength of about 100 people who are just going out, selling stoves, collecting credit data, managing other credit relationships and so. And uh, if we can move to the next slide. And uh, what I wanted to do very quickly is to distill down some of the things that have worked for us and some of the things that haven't worked for us. Uh, starting with what has worked, uh, positioning ourselves as a good for everyone brand has definitely worked. Um, we do everything from manufacturing distribution to end consumer support. And just whether it is partnering with um, other partner organizations or even with the end consumer, just a good for everyone brand does sell better. It's, it's just better marketing in that sense. We can go back to my slide. Um, another, I think a bigger learning that uh, most entrepreneurs, including ourselves, we missed at the start was that willingness to pay is not demand. Willingness to pay is different from ability to pay. And it is when people are able to pay and when there is willingness is where you actually have demand. And this has been a hard lesson to learn. It has been rather hard to understand who are the consumers who actually have the ability to pay for our stores, which start at about $25. And even those $25 have more or less have had to be sold on at least six month installments or 12 month installments. And how do you, as an entrepreneur or as a business, go to only those segments or identify those segments where there is ability and focus your energy in terms of building market awareness, demand in those segments itself. And that's not easy considering how big and how, how um, diverse this market is. It is not easy. Just in India, we're talking 700 million people, each and every one of them different from the other. The third thing that I wanted to speak about that has worked is engaging women as product promoters. Now, this, uh, this, is, this has also been a purely business-driven decision for us. So we work with about um, 800 women who act as product promoters and uh, rely on us and we rely them for some income and we rely them on them for sales. And the reason for this is uh, rather simple. We've over the years learned that instead of trying to engage men, and here we are speaking in the context of a fairly patriarchal country, instead of engaging men, this may sound odd, it's best to just avoid them. Which is why having women to sell a product like clean cook stoves just makes better business sense. You get higher conversions, you get a higher ROI on the time spent by each and every promoter on the field. And it's just better business. The fourth thing that has definitely worked for us is having stable supplies or stable production, just um, having a stable supply chain. And I mean this in the context of actually manufacturing stores uh, enables to smoothen out uh, the scaling into new areas and into more numbers and also stabilizes the unit economics. Uh, very quickly, coming out of what hasn't worked for us, and uh, I, I would not generalize this, this is still specific to our kind of a business, is uh, the first thing is village level entrepreneurs. And I, uh, I make this point because most low income people don't want to become entrepreneurs in the sense that it actually um, asks for them to take financial risk. And most uh, individuals and especially women do not wish to take any financial risk, which is why most of us don't want to take any financial risk. So it's not very different, but they're willing to trade effort and hard work for income. And that is how we deal with our promoters that you put in the time. You don't have to invest in buying stoves from us to sell them further. You book orders we will deliver and we will pay you a commission based on the number of stores which have been sold. But um, just trying to develop enterprises of uh, local micro distributors is something that hasn't worked for us. And this stands true for across genders. What has also not worked is offering product customizations. 
we right now manufacture just two main SKUs, which are mass manufactured. And a few years ago, we used to manufacture about six to seven customized products, which just increased the decision making load on the consumer, on the sales team, as well as um, a fair bit of overload on the production team, which as a, as a business, uh, I mean, it's of course great to offer consumers as much variety and choice as you can. But as a business, it hasn't made sense for us. Um, the third thing which I encourage other enterprises also to avoid is separating out marketing and awareness from the points of sale or the time of sale. There are plenty of um, enterprises and campaigns that market clean cooking solutions and other solutions that create awareness about a solution but do not immediately give the users an opportunity to buy the product or invest in the product there and then, which essentially leads to lost awareness or marketing dollars. We used to do that, some of this initially, and then did realize that this wasn't working. And the fourth thing, which is also um, avoidable, and we've actually lost a little bit of money doing this, is offering very long credit just assessing that the ability to pay is low and ending up offering very long credit like two years on a cook store actually hasn't worked when ability to pay is low which is true for again a few more than a few hundred million individuals in india even long credit does not work there unfortunately has to be um, some either subsidy support or carbon support or uh, some other intervention like that because that is just the reality of what it is. I think I am, I am done with my points. Mm -hmm. yes. Thanks, Neha. It's, it's, so, it's so wonderful for those of us who sit in the policy world um, without kind of the chance to have our hands on the ground, as it were, um, to hear from yeah. people like you. It's, um, it's remarkable and and um, just inspiring to hear what what your organization has done. Um, we have about twelve or thirteen minutes for questions, and so I will turn right away to that, and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, a good number have come in, and I've also been really happy to see that a good number have also been answered in real time in the chat. Um, so. To the best of our ability, I'll only ask the questions that haven't been written um, by, um, by chat. And, and maybe what I'll do, because there's several here, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read out the questions and then we can, we can take them um, as a batch. So, okay. First one is around um, kind of broadening the, inc the inclusion aperture to, to address disability and age. The elderly and the very young, basically those who are not um, productive labor in an economy but also need access. Um, maybe um, Lucy and Uta um, can speak to that. Um, someone raised the, the challenge of, of high interest rates for local entrepreneurs um, and wondered how, how to address that. Um, and then Great, so many have been answered. Um, and then we have a question about how women can be supported as entrepreneurs and brought into the decision, no, sorry, the design process for clean cooking products. Maybe that's a question for you, Neha, maybe best to you. Um, I don't know who feels best positioned to, to address um, the interest rates, but I'll just leave that open. Um, maybe Lucy and Uta, um, the inclusion, disability and age start there? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, it's a very good question. And I, I know that in, uh, when we looked at, we, we debated what aspects of inclusion we, should, we could realistically look at in the 2018 edition. Um, and uh, I realized that we only focused on um, gender, remoteness, and poverty aspects. And uh, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, there are these other cross-cutting issues of uh, age and disability and so on that are really crucial to look at. Um, so uh, what we felt was that, you know, uh, in some contexts, those 
those might be really important issues to look at. And actually, I think looking at the uh, example from the South African off-grid um, electrification with their solar home systems that we looked at in the 2018 edition, we found that actually there were quite a number of uh, of more elderly people who had benefited from some of those because they were uh, often um, uh, able to benefit because they fell into the poorest categories. So sometimes age and poverty kind of um, overlap. Uh, um, and so they had been able to access the uh, sort of home systems through through that system. But um, the way that had worked had not been had not been ideal. So I think sometimes uh, so what I'm saying is, yes, it's it, where that's where these issues are relevant. It'd be great to try to include them. And we realized that we only focused on a narrow range of of uh, of inclusivity just to kind of try to make a, a clear point about it. And that sometimes perhaps one of the best ways of, of coming at that would be through things like social protection and safety nets, where sometimes those uh, systems are beginning to function for uh, for older people where they might be um, able to benefit from certain kinds of um, social safety nets that are offered through the state or that could be established um, to help them access access that. So, yeah, I know I didn't talk about the very young, but yeah. I think that might come into the kind of poverty aspects or households that include lots of very young people. Yeah. Maybe maybe Neha next. We can hear from you on on uh, engaging women in the design process. Yes, uh, Caroline. So the thing is that if you don't engage women in the design process, you won't sell because men most men don't cook, especially in rural parts of the world, and. Uh, you know, so in our, I mean, I'm slightly embarrassed to admit this, but the first few designs that we, uh, that we created were pretty much lab created and didn't work. It was finally after talking to women, sitting with women, you know, sort of internalizing the process by cooking on a traditional stove ourselves, did we get to a design which was just about remotely acceptable. But I think it uh, requires, I would say that it requires a more, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not getting the English word for this, but uh, a more as localized, just becoming a local and internalizing the problem with women, which basically means a lot of sitting together, a lot of working together. There is just no other way. So you need to reach out to rural communities. You need to, you know, be there and um, focus more on what the consumer is saying as opposed to what... Um, there's also a tendency in the clean cook stove sector to get uh, carried away by sometimes what uh, you know funders are expecting, which is at odds with what the consumer's requirements are. And, uh, and the consumer in this case is a woman and, and in all probability is a woman. So you just need to work with women by being with them. I'm not sure if I can hear no, that, you know, good insight. That was great. That was great. Now, um, Emma volunteered to, to tackle that interest rate question. So over to, and maybe Drew could chime in a bit too. Uh, thanks. Well, so, I mean, I'm going to talk uh, a bit in a bit, uh, take a bit of a narrow focus and focus specifically on last mile distribution companies in answering this question. But I, I think that, that the answer applies more broadly to companies across the sector. Um, in, in our survey of distributors, high interest rates came back often as being a, a key challenge um, for local entrepreneurs. Um, and a lot of distributors were forced to accept um, very high interest rates to take on loans um, and, and were actually able to pay back those loans um, surprisingly often, um, but, but definitely created challenges for, for managing their working capital. Um, fundamentally, it's a problem about risk and how risk is assessed by investors. Um, I think there are a couple of sort of areas that can help address this challenge. So first of all, I think data um, is a is a is a key area to to help bring down interest rates. I think if investors um, and banks can better understand um, and and benchmark uh, companies um, against the broad a broader sector, um, then that uh, helps them to understand uh, risk levels um, and 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 bring down their their transaction costs um, as well. Um, I think secondly, it's about supporting with improving the investment readiness of some of these companies to again help 
uh, bring down uh, risk levels um, and making sure that distribution companies understand what type of capital they actually need to grow grow because often companies are talking to investors about debt when actually they need equity or, or vice versa. Um, and thirdly, I think there's a, a role for subsidy here and financing mechanisms like first loss guarantees can, can play a role um, in bringing down risk for investors and for, and for banks and helping to bring down those interest rates and make loans more accessible for local entrepreneurs. Thanks, Emma. Drew, do you want to chime in? Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'll, I mean, investment finance isn't really my bag, but let me let me share what I know um, from the kind of global perspective. Thinking about manufacturers and um, larger distributors, as opposed to Emma talking about last mile. So, Google members have secured uh, equity and debt finance, um, largely from uh, development finance institutes, um, impact investors, green finance, and more recently there's been a, a wave of investment from um, this in four Japanese conglomerates have invested in, uh, such as B-Box, Mobisol, and um, also NG and Shell, some of the energy incumbents have made investments in the sector. Um, so yeah, largely kind of, you know, international players and lo local banks are, you know, still staying away. I mean, it's fair to say. And I, I understand a, a local bank will typically need, you know, a track record of, of five years and a, and a healthy balance sheet, including a profitable business, which, you know, basically doesn't really exist um, yet in the sector. Um, so, you know, I think this, this investment landscape does create gaps and risks uh, for the sector, and um, you know I think that needs to be needs to be addressed. Um, Emma talks about um, some of the principles around you know um, transparency, investment readiness, you know helping with the consumer affordability and some of the of the fundamental market barriers, and, and I think that, that holds true um, for for manufacturers and uh, distributors as well. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. So I'm looking at the clock. And um, before we wrap up, I want to do um, what I, I, <laughs> I'm very excited about this because I'm so intrigued at what people will say. But we'll do a lightning round uh, of, of hearing from each of our speakers um, on what has surprised them in their work, um, whether in the research findings, in, um, you know, experiences out in the field, just just um, anything that isn't quite um, how you assumed it would would be and maybe we can go in order that we we did from the, the top of the program so let's see Lucy um, we'll start with you uh, I think that um, I'm just trying to think what what surprised me I mean I think I think the one thing that surprised me about about the from the clean cooking findings was was just how much uh, some of the people that we spoke to um, for the 2016 report were really keen to leapfrog so really clean solutions they were fed up with with all the the issues that are around cooking cooking with uh, um, with solutions that you'd think that people are keen to stay with although you know we find that uh, in other surveys people also want to stick with some people are happy to stick with their traditional solutions but because they have so many multifunctions that that meet their needs but on the other hand you know the the, the numbers are up to half in some places of people that really wanted to shift to an entirely clean solution um was way more than i had I, I expected i was quite surprised by that and i think it's um uh, something that we need to to build on and recognize for the future. Thanks, Lucy. Ute? Mute. Sorry, just took a while to unmute myself there. Yeah, again, uh, with clean cooking, you know, I mean, when, when you when you used to cooking with clean fuels or electricity and you you go into say one of these huts where you see how awful the smoke is and everything you sort of think well it's totally obvious that this is incredibly damaging and everyone should want to go get away from it and that then just doesn't recognize some of the realities and of course you don't forget well of course people also have other priorities and in the end you know when when it is um, 
clean cooking versus electricity, lighting, what have you, then, then those decisions aren't so easily made. I did find it quite funny also that one of the reasons um, people said was, oh, well, the husbands wanted to keep uh, the smoke to uh, keep mosquitoes away. <laughs> That's a slight surprise. All right, next to Drew, since we don't have Donna with us. Yeah, I often say I'm not surprised by anything anymore, um, but I guess, I guess that's not satisfactory here. Um, I, I think the, the fatigue, in, in the, the general fatigue that with, the, with the lighting market, you know, people say it's had a successful decade, you know, it's, it's commercial, it can stand alone, you know, maybe it doesn't deliver the impact of a larger system. I think that's, that surprises me. Um, you know, I think we've, there's been a, a good decade and now we need to redouble our efforts towards 2030 to make the benefits of, of basic lighting available um, for, um, for everyone everywhere. Great. Emma. Uh, very good question. Um, I think something that surprised me is the extent to which we are all, as an international development community, still working very much in silos. Um, we found that 54 percent, so more than half of last mile distribution companies are selling more than one type of product. So not that many are focusing on a, on a single product category. Um, and I think this represents a real opportunity to be breaking down some of those silos and recognizing the fact that last mile consumers have a range of needs and there's potential to create impact um, across sectors. And I think we really need to do more to, to take action across sectors and, and, and bring all those conversations together um, because there's a real missed opportunity there. Yeah, that integration. Neha, last but not yes. least, again. <laughs> yes. well, so I come from a background of uh, having other startups before starting Greenway and what surprises me most is that um, investors in this sector, all, all categories included or financing included, are more risk averse than regular investors. I mean, we are, uh, we are dealing with problems that are large, difficult, and very, very complex and messy, but we're also dealing with problems that, are, that can potentially create and are creating very big markets. So I think there needs to be some, so the attitude of investors in terms of taking risk has been uh, quite, quite surprising compared to starting another business or a regular startup in India or so. Great. Thank you all. Thanks for in indulging that particular question of mine. Um, but I think it's a great, it's a great way to, to wrap us up. Um, I have been scribbling takeaways. There have been so many, um, but I'll just give you three as sort of a proxy for a recap here. Um, I think that recommendations in this report are great and I hope to see them spread far and wide. Um, but the focus on demand, not just supply, I think that's so important and meeting people where they are. Um, that's geographically, but also economically. Um, that voices matter. We need to, to listen and, and get those voices into planning processes and multi-stakeholder dialogues, et cetera. And, and finally, I think Donna said this, but um, faster and more inclusive must go hand in hand. Um, we can't leave inclusion for later because um, you're not going to get to scale by just pursuing the lowest hanging fruit. Um, so such a rich discussion. Thank you ag again so much. Thanks to our presenters, Uta and Lucy. Thanks to our discussants for their great insights. That's Donna, Emma, Drew, and Neha. Thanks to the team behind the scenes that helped make all this happen. You know who you are. Mm -hmm. And thanks to all of you who joined us for your engagement, all your good questions, the work you're no doubt doing that's aligned with the PPEO's focus on working with the poor to end energy poverty. Please keep it up. And on behalf of all of us here at Sustainable Energy for All, best wishes for the holiday season. Rest up over the holidays and we'll see you right back here in January for the final decade push to Sustainable Energy for All. Thanks, everyone.